Alzheimer's disease has until fairly recently been viewed as this illness of the brain that is sort of inevitable. There are genetic predisposition, we can trace it in families, we've identified genes that may contribute to its expression in older age. But we've kind of accepted that this is a normal disease of aging where the cells of the brain suffer as and we become forgetful. So um, in recent years though, research has shown that that might not be correct. Certainly there is a genetic predisposition, but it doesn't mean that everybody having this predisposition will end up developing Alzheimer's disease. And why is that? Um, we found out that there's m there are many factors now that are contributing that we can control. So in recent years, and studies have shown this, we can think more of Alzheimer's as a metabolic disease of the brain. Just as we think of diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, is a metabolic disease where you know, the uptake of glucose is impaired and we have a lot of complications from that. The brain or, or Alzheimer's development is sort of thought of by some scientists as type 3 diabetes, so diabetes of the brain, where we have a metabolic issue that does not allow the neurons, the cells in the brain, to take up sufficient nutrients to function and they starve. And the starvation of the cells in the brain is what causing what causes them to, to die. And that carries with it all the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, the memory loss and, and many of the other personality changes, uh, all that come with basically a deterioration of the brain from a metabolic uh, deprivation. And um, it's a very interesting thing. So I think it's an oversimplification to say it's just the metabolic disorder. And many researchers, so. I dove a bit more into that. I used to treat people with Alzheimer's disease. I used to work in geriatrics and it was always devastating to me. We used medications and um, we used vitamin E and whatever we felt had some impact. But if anything, it might have slowed it down a tiny bit, but it always seemed that the um, progression was inevitable. So now with some new studies that focus more on the metabolic component, they found that nutritional changes and um, in some studies they've done uh, changes using a ketogenic diet where we go away from the normal utilization of sugar in the cells to the utilization of ketone bodies that are made by the liver as fats get broken down. That people with early Alzheimer's that were put on this had a remarkable change um, in their cognition. They became a lot better. And so I want to talk about that as well a bit right now. So. When we look again about deterioration of the neurons in the brain, it's not something that happens overnight. Like with most diseases or diseases of modern civilization, they build up over time. And I always used to think, you know, as, you, as you're younger, enjoy your sugars and your candy and, and, and eat junk food and all that. And then when you get a bit older, you should change these patterns. But lately I've started to think that that might not be the right approach because when we think of all these diseases of modern civilization and we can group into their high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, autoimmune disorders. These are all diseases that are much more prevalent now than they were, for example, in 1900. And that's a big change. So when you look back at 1900, 1910, it was very hard to identify any cases of heart disease, any cases of severe diabetes, and even obesity was much lower. So now, as we've become you know, medically better equipped in modern society, why are we now suffering more from these things? Some people say, well, maybe it wasn't recorded as much, but that's not, that's not quite true. The other argument is, well, we have a longer life expectancy right now. So yes, we do. However, part of that you know, uh, increased life expectancy is because we have less uh, death in early life, in, in childhood, you know, less death occurring during childbirth. So when you adjust for all those facts, you know, even back then in the 1800s and early 1900s, people some people got very, very old and they did not have uh, uh, to a significant amount of diseases we have now. You look back to about 1900, 1910, for example, the incidence of um, heart disease or, or, or heart attack was very low, maybe about 1%. Now we're at 30%, same for cancer, 2% maybe, 30% now. That's a huge change. And so we can't really explain this simply by saying, well, we're now growing older or, or other things. There are definitely factors that are that are impacting this in a, in a very negative way. So in Alzheimer's disease, again, the studies are now focused on changing nutritional patterns. And I mentioned earlier, you know, and people have tried a ketogenic diet, so a diet that utilizes a different source of energy. And it seems that the brain is really thriving on this. 
Um, this is a bit of a complicated thing. We have to understand the normal cell metabolism. So most of the Western diet is high in carbohydrates. We're trying to be low in fats. And then the rest of it is protein, fiber, vitamins, all these kind of things. So when we have a normal carbohydrate metabolism in our cells, and this is a bit of a cell biology right now, um, you have the nucleus in the cell, that's where the DNA is, and then you have all these little organelles. And some of these organelles are our powerhouses, the mitochondria. And the mitochondria are very important in our cells as they are really supplying the energy needed to do all the metabolic functions in our cells, making proteins, keeping the cell healthy. Without the mitochondria it functioning properly, the cell will die. So the mitochondria have a hugely important function. Now, in a normal carbohydrate metabolism, to just really oversimplify this, because otherwise this would be a very, very, very long video. Um, in a sugar metabolism, people have heard of the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. So the glucose molecule enters and we make an energy currency called ATP, right? This is the normal way that we process carbohydrates. So even when you think of long chains of carbohydrates, if you eat potatoes or you eat pasta, or you think of simple carbohydrates, when I mean, you think your, your uh, sugars from candy and so on, they all ultimately form either glucose or other sugars that then get metabolized. So as they're broken down, we produce a lot of um, uh, junk, free radicals, which are, which are not really clean and they need to be taken care of. They can be damaging to the DNA, they can be damaging to the cell as a whole. So it's sort of running like a normal gas, gasoline burning engine. So the engine's running and we're producing, you know, a lot of pollution that needs to be cleaned up as well, or it could be very damaging. So that is one way to make energy. Um, if we go in a period of starvation, let's say people do intermittent fasting or they uh, purposely are going very low on their carbohydrates and even to the point where the carbohydrates get so low that the body is not able to sustain its energy needs from carbohydrates, then the body is forced to switch to burning fats. And um, these fats are broken down and, and they are particles that are produced in the liver. They're called ketones. And these ketones can be burned as energy, just like sugar can, but in a different way. And that is sort of, when you think about it, if you think of sugar or carbohydrates being a gasoline engine, then fats, as they are broken down to ketones and used in our cells, are like an electric engine. So it's a much cleaner energy. It doesn't produce pollution. And it has actually a lot of energy that we can extract from that. It is a very good way to feed our cells, also the cells of our brain, our neurons. Because these ketones, they can cross this blood-brain barrier and be absolutely used in the brain very well. In fact, the brain may sometimes prefer to use ketones and it works better. When you hear people going on a ketogenic diet, they always describe after that first week, that's kind of difficult. Um, they kind of have, uh, once they're adjusted to using ketones, they feel really good. They have this mental clarity. They concentrate better. They're more productive. And that's because the brain thrives on ketones. It works really well on ketones. That is not to say that we, the brain doesn't use any sugar at all. But even if you decrease your carbohydrates significantly to the point where there's so little that you're really on this ketogenic diet, you're making ketones and you're running on it, the processes in the brain that need sugar are still supplied because our body is able to make those sugars itself. Something called gluconeogenesis. That's a really long word, but when you break it down, glucose comes from you know sugar from glucose. And neogenesis means making new, so making your own sugar that supplies those processes. So you never have to worry about some processes of your brain not running if you cut down on your carbohydrates. That simply won't happen. The body is very good at, at adjusting to this. And there are many civilizations that through prolonged periods are only using fats and proteins and they are thriving on this. And then, you know, in the summer they might have some fruit or other things where then they kind of switch to a carbohydrate metabolism again. So this is actually something that we observed and something that is actually very, very healthy to do. So you shouldn't be afraid of it. Now, how does this tie into Alzheimer's disease? So they found that um, people that already have Alzheimer's, so, you know, throughout their lives, they have um, damaged their metabolic processes in their cells, including the neurons. And that is one from a high processed carbohydrate diet. But the more important part is actually eating uh, what we do in Western civilization, eating these seed oils or polyunsaturated fatty acids or vegetable oils. And I talked in another video about this briefly, but these are oils that you see everywhere. Soybean oil, canola oil, sunflower oil. Now, 
especially when they're chemically produced, when they're extracted using molecules like hexane. I mean, this actually makes it a lot worse. If they're cold pressed, some people argue there might be some that might still be okay. No matter what, they are very high in omega-6 fatty acids. And we know these are very inflammatory. They can't be burned easily like normal fats are, like fats you get from the good fats we keep talking about, from butter or coconut oil or olive oil um, or avocado oil. These fats are actually very usable, very good, and they um, you know, can be used as energy very easily. Um, these polyunsaturated fatty acids, these vegetable oils, seed oils, whatever you want to call them, they cannot easily be used like that. And uh, it's something that, again, in our Western diet, when you look from the early 1900s to today, we have an incredible increase in the use of these fatty acids. So these seed oils or vegetable oils, when you look back at, let's say, the early 1900s, there might have been about two to three grams a day that we consumed from those omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs. Today, we're at like 80 grams a day. There's a huge increase. At the same time, we see, as I mentioned earlier, this huge increase in uh, metabolic disorders from heart disease, cancer, autoimmune disorders, um, diabetes. So there certainly is a correlation. Now, any researcher would say, well, correlation doesn't always equal causation, but it's pretty profound. And they have replicated in studies, at least in rodents, um, that this actually holds true. If you feed rodents these bad oils, they become sick and fat and uh, you know, have a lot of disease and they die, die earlier. And um, if you give them a diet that's uh, full of good fats, they don't. So anyway, so now they looked at people that already had early Alzheimer's. So throughout their lives, um, these cells have become damaged and they are not very good at taking up sugar, glucose, or other sugars again for functioning. So this whole process, this insulin resistance that we see in the peripheral tissues with diabetes is happening in the brain. And these cells are struggling and some cells are dying. And then we see already the first signs of Alzheimer's. And that's usually the stage when I would start treating someone. And again, we used medications, we used some supplements and nothing really made a huge difference. It didn't even slow it down. Now in this research, and I'll link a few studies to this video, they showed that giving these people a ketogenic diet, so decreasing their carbohydrates to the point where the body was forced to burn fat as, as, a, as a nutrient, as the energy currency, they saw suddenly that these people did a lot better. They became cognitively sharper. It kind of reversed some of the symptoms that they had. The forgetfulness got better. They remembered things. It was remarkable. So how did that work? Well, <clears throat> the, even though the metabolism of sugars has been damaged over time, remember this insulin resistance was there, sugar just didn't get in the cells, the cells were starving, all of a sudden we made another air energy currency, the ketones available. And the brains, remember, thrive on ketones. They like ketones. So, and this metabolism was still intact. And it's an easier one. Again, it doesn't produce so much uh, pollution as it burns. It's a cleaner energy currency. And it is something that the brain likes to, uh, to do and, and prefers almost, almost to use. So these people got a lot better. Now, these are early studies. Um, I think it's amazing to see how people are responding. I think this is a, a great thing we're doing right now to find out how can we treat Alzheimer's with this change in uh, diet, in, including this ketogenic uh, eating. There are other factors, and I want to mention this quickly, that contribute to Alzheimer's. It's not as simple as just what you've been eating all your life and, and how bad your diet was. There could be um, other nutrients that the brain needs, for example, oxygen. And there are many researchers looking into, for example, if there's overnight, um, especially if you have an oxygen deprivation of the brain, something called sleep apnea, where suddenly the oxygen saturation drops overnight, certainly that contributes as well. So these are vital things for any cell, but the neurons, you know, there's a finite amount, you know, they generally don't uh, uh, divide anymore. You know, you have a certain amount of brain cells and as they die, we can't really replace them. We can shift functions and you see this with people that had a stroke where part of the brain died suddenly they regain function, but that has to do with the plasticity of the brain, where other parts of the brain take over. But the cells itself, we don't have a good way yet to repair or to ask neurons to divide after they, they, have, they have a certain amount. You're actually born with more, some get weeded out in childhood, and then we're stuck with what we have. And so if they deteriorate, it's hard to really um, make a big impact there. But anyway, so now you have um, 
an energy currency that the neurons like. The, the um, cells get nutrition again, so they can thrive again and they can be uh, productive. And you're saving the neurons that were on their way of almost dying by now changing the dietary pattern to that. So uh, besides the oxygen um, desaturation, that's another point that we need to address. There are certain toxins that of course can contribute, certain molds might contribute. And these are all factors that we might be able to control. So healthy living, of course, um, trying to weed out those things. And then what I mentioned earlier, dietary wise, the seed oils, I think are pretty much one of the highest risk factor because the seed oils also kind of impair the mitochondrial function. And you hear me talking about mitochondria all the time. We're understanding more and more how important these organelles are for the health of our cell. I mean, they're ultimately very important with any uh, modern disease as we know it. So really protecting our mitochondria, allowing them to have a healthy energy production is crucial to prevent disease and also to treat disease. So um, I think it's great that we have the studies now that show that people with Alzheimer's respond to a change in dietary pattern and respond by changing um, into a ketogenic diet. But I think what we need to always address is it's, you know, and I think it's really uh, not done enough. In traditional medicine, we treat when the illness presents. And I think that's a big mistake. I am very interested and I practice more preventive medicine. And I think that is important because it is much easier to prevent an illness from happening than to treat it once it's there. And that's always the case. So with Alzheimer's to prevent it, start at a very young age. And even I'm trying to do this with my children already, you know, watch what they're eating cut out those seed oils, those polyunsaturated fatty acids, the soybean oil, the sunflower oil, the canola oil, as much as we can, it's in everything. So read the packages, right? Give them healthy fats, that is butter, ghee if you can afford it. I buy butter, it's much cheaper. Um, olive oil, avocado oil, coconut oil. So having healthy fats, right? Um, healthy proteins, eggs, free range eggs. So again, make sure if you get um, animal products that they're very clean, right? Um, meats, grass-fed, of course, you know, and all these kind of things. Um, healthy uh, choices there, decreasing the inflammatory component and decreasing total carbohydrate intake even when we're younger. We don't all have to go on a ketogenic diet. And I think that's also not quite realistic. But going to a much lower carbohydrate diet, and that also includes decreasing things like fruit. Yes, while it's healthy and it has vitamins and, 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 and minerals and pectins and all these things, Fruit has fructose and fructose is very bad. Um, you might have heard the term high fructose corn syrup. That's probably the worst thing you probably eat. So decreasing that, maybe one or two pieces of fruit a day, cutting out cereals, decreasing bread, you know, pasta or rice to much smaller amounts, eating healthier fats, cutting out the bad fats. That is, I think, how we can really decrease the risk of having disease later in life. And when we're younger, that's kind of a hard thing to foresee. But, you know, the, these damages to the cells, they don't happen overnight. It's a slow process. And I think through early intervention and smart behaviors, we will be healthier. We will avoid things like um, obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease. And certainly one of the things that we're really also very worried about is dementia, dementia of Alzheimer's type mostly. And we can avoid, I think, going in that direction or at least delaying it significantly by making better choices today. Okay, hope that was helpful. Thank you.